Uh, oh, sound seems muted after recording. So no, it's an issue with the I see. Okay. Uh, oh, there's another one. Okay. Okay. Fine. Good. Um, yeah. So I'd like to thank the ENS and um, IHES for being uh, uh, welcoming hosts. And um, uh, uh, so, so today, in fact, I'm talking about something which had its seeds when I was sort of first in the IHP. Uh, sort of 20 years ago, um, uh, and, and, and that those seeds were sort of uh, sown when I was actually lecturing to um, uh, a group at Jusieu, um led by Gennady Henkin. Uh, Gennady Henkin. Um, uh, and this is, this is the first part of my talk. So this is um, adapting some work I was doing back then uh, with Claude Le Brun, and um, uh, uh, what this will do is it will give a presentation of self-dual gravity in four dimensions. And uh, the reason why it becomes timely again after 20 years is because the um, uh, uh, one of the things that it does is it, is it sort of manifests the um, uh, geometrically this so-called LW1 plus infinity symmetry that uh, Andy Schrominger recently, uh, well, and Andy Schrominger and many, many friends in Harvard uh, uh, discovered um, last year in their studies of celestial gravity, and and so so uh, L W. Well, I'll say a bit more about what L W one plus infinity um, symmetry is, uh, uh, but it was um, yeah, it, it was something which had um, its origins in the nineteen eighties and um, play, played a, a big role in formal field theory, and uh, but he, here what I'll show is how it is that it sort of comes straight out of twisted theory. So that, that, that'll be the first part of this lecture uh, to explain those ideas from sort of 20 years ago. And um, uh, the second part will be to talk about gravity attitudes in this context. And uh, so, so this will be sort of developing ideas that sort of um, in some sense go back to the twisted string. So that's maybe another 20 years. So that was new when I was here at the IHP 20 years ago, or it was, it was nascent at that point. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, these have been developed over the last 20 years uh, to, to provide these rather remarkable sort of formulae for tree level amplitudes, for the tree level S matrix of four dimensional gravity. One, one of, apology I should make is that these um, ideas are all going to be expressed in split signature. So uh, most of you probably think that. Physics is something that happens in the red signature with one plus and three minuses, and um, uh, 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 the uh, but but it's one of those things where um, where people have been used to doing width rotations over the years to Euclidean signature, and of course you do that to try and sort of get rid of singularities that uh, you might otherwise have to confront head on in quantum field theory. But when you study amplitudes, you rather like the singularities. They're, they're things that um, have a lot of structural information. And uh, uh, so, so there's a long history of, um, uh, uh, well, first of all, analysis continuation. So you see the singularities. And then uh, again, sort of 20 years ago with the Twister String, Wisdom sort of um, uh, started this idea of um, analytically continuing to split signature in order to see the Twister support of amplitudes. And this is a, a theme that has sort of extended and extended over the years now to uh, the um, Grassmannian and positive Grassmannian and amplitudehedron. And um, uh, uh, these ideas have played a very prominent role in sort of um, uh, re recent work. So uh, in many ways, I probably have to be less apologetic now than I had to be 20 years ago to be working in this kind of wrong signature. I mean, a key point to take away though is if you're interested in scattering amplitudes, particularly at tree level, they, 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 they have uh, analytic continuation properties that allow you to sort of um, uh, go to any signature. Okay, so, um, uh, so, 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 so that's just a brief summary of what I was going to talk about. And oh, yeah, sorry, it was being slow. Actually, I forgot there's a lag between this and the screen. So, so, so um, one of the things I want to make contact with then is the Celestial Holography Program. Uh, and um, just to explain how it is that I intend to do that. Um, well, first of all, what is the Celestial Holography Program? So we have one of the great representatives here with Andrea and, uh, 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 and, 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 and this, this is meant to be finding the kind of um, the, the 
lambda equals zero, cosmological constant equals zero version of ads -CFT that would um, find a boundary theory that, that uh, encodes or constructs four-dimensional gravity. But in this case, instead of having a, um, uh, a ADS uh, infinity, we have this light-like scry. So I'm drawing here um, uh, 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 infinity is non-infinity. So, so it's a, it's a light cone, um, essentially. Uh, or this in Lorentz, I've drawn the Lorentz signature picture in which you think of um, infinity as being a pair of light cones. We will see later that in split signature, there's only one component, but uh, uh, that that's the Lorentzian uh, picture. Now, this kind of holog holography is something that has a long history in the world of twister ideas. And, um, uh, uh, it, it, you know, so after Roger Penrose introduced uh, null infinity, uh, Ted Newman's tensor law design trying to rebuild space time from what he called the cuts of scry. And so the cuts of scry are what you get when you um, uh, think of a light cone in the interior space time. I should have maybe drawn one in the picture. So you take a point in, oops, take a point in the interior space time, and uh, uh, its light cone will go out, and it will cut scry in some sort of cross section uh, of, of 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 the cone as drawn, and. Um, uh, and so Ted Newman wants to rebuild space-time in terms of the cuts of light cones. And he wrote down this condition that he called the good cut equation, a very simple equation, uh, you, you will see it later, and uh, argued that that good cut equation has a four-dimensional parameter, four-dimensional family of solutions. And he discovered that, in fact, this it, it even had a metric. Uh, uh, but it wasn't the original space-time, it's um, what became known as H-space. Um, uh, H being short for heaven, as being where the good, his, his had very bad sense of humor, the good cones go, you know, the good cones went to heaven. Uh, so that was the, um, uh, as in good light cones. So uh, anyway, so he constructed this complex self-dual space-time. Uh, and this was from the asymptotic data of the gravitational field at null infinity. Penrose then reinterpreted that in terms of um, a, a twister space that you could construct at null infinity. And this is what led to um, uh, what, at least for some of us, uh, is the famous nonlinear graviton construction. So the nonlinear graviton construction took um, ordinary twister space, which is complex projected tree space, deformed it a bit, and uh, deformed a complex structure on it. So you have to throw away parts of it or do something. And uh, you get this curved twister space, and that reconstructs um, uh, a curved self to your space time that was Ricci flat. So, so, so this, so Roger Penrose translated this into twister theory. And later on, it's emerged that this uh, embodied the integrability of the self to your sector of gravity and indeed Yang Mills and so on. So then, so that was all the 70s, uh, sort of 50 uh, something, well, 50 odd years ago. Um, more recently then, following from the um, uh, twister string then, uh, what, what, what I'll be talking about in the second half of the talk would be how Carl Sigmund models in, in twister space, these are holomorphic maps into twister space, they, give, they, they, they can be used to construct the full 4D gravity S matrix. So this takes you beyond the self dual sector. So for, um, between the 70s and the noughties, so to speak, Twister theory was confined to studying the self dual sector of gravity and Yang Mills theory, but with the advent of the twister string, we could actually, at least conservatively, get access to the, 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 uh, the, the whole of uh, Yang Mills and gravity theories. Okay, so any questions? Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, so, so, parallel development, so, the, the, so part of this talk is about scattering amplitudes. So, 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 what do we know about um, gravity scattering amplitude? So, 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 this this slide is somehow meant to take you up to roughly speaking two thousand and twelve. Um, so, so, what do you do? Well, you you imagine you've got n gravitons coming in. They they interact and um, uh, 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 go out again, or um, and and so 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 you have these n gravitons, and they're going to have me momenta k. I from I equals one to N. But you also need to encode their polarization data, but in four dimensions, you can do this very simply with two component spinners. 
So it's well known that, that, that a, um, a, a four uh, momentum can be factorized if it's null into a product of two spinners. So here denoted kappa alpha and kappa alpha dot. And uh, 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 obviously you don't know the scaling of the individual spinners just from the momentum, but the polarization data does determine the scaling of the spinner. So in fact, you expect um, uh, uh, an amplitude to be an expression that you can construct out of those spinners with certain weights in the sort of uh, the dotted and the undotted half of the um, uh, 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 momentum. And in order to write down um, uh, amplitudes, uh, that, uh, the, the formula you do get complicated. And if you want to see the structure uh, that people have developed this spinner helicity notation, whereby a, um, sorry, if I use the mouse, whereby the uh, contraction of undotted spinners are given by angle brackets and dotted spinners given by square brackets. And then maybe you can contract a, a vector into two spinners in this expression here. Uh, um, K2 contracted into kappa one and kappa three dot. And, and uh, so uh, uh, it's been remarked many, many times that if you try to do conservative gravity, you get into an incredible mess. So the um, uh, uh, heroic calculations of Bryce DeWitt were concerned with four, four point amplitudes uh, in uh, tree level. Uh, three papers, very, very long, uh, 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 a, a typical lecture on this might sort of give you 10 pages of calculations from that that lead to this uh, three-point amplitude. The three-point amplitude actually sits on one line as one term, sorry, four-point amplitude. The four-point amplitude sits on one line as just one term in this spinner notation. Uh, 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 but what's much, much more remarkable is that the endpoint amplitude, if you just have two negative helicity and the rest positive, uh, has this... Um, very, very highly structured form formula in terms of this, um, what I've, uh, I, I often tend to call Hodges matrices now after Andrew Hodges, who discovered this formula 10 years ago. So the same as the plateau formula? Uh, well, so, 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 so what is this formula? You, you, you're taking the square bracket of the IJ momentum spinners divided by the angle bracket, and you form this matrix, HIJ, whose off diagonal entries are just that term there, and then the diagonal terms uh, are designed in such a way as to um, uh, make the row sums add up to zero. I'm, I'm slightly. Yeah, but you use it for the right kind of object. It's not usual, so you see my way. It's a very nice object. You will notice it's not formula. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but it's not part Taylor. This is uh, part Taylor is Young Notes. So this is. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not This is MHV, is what you mean. Yeah, yeah. This is the MHV formula. So, 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 so Andrew discovered this useful formula whereby, well, it turns out, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, it turns out that this matrix is actually degenerate, but you can define a reduced determinant. You know what its kernel is, and that allows you to define a reduced determinant. And so that's basically all there is, apart from this factor out the front to make the weights right. Uh, one and two are meant to be the negative helicity gravitons. Uh, yeah, so momentum conservation, one and two, and this debt. And uh, this actually related to a rather nice, um, uh, a rather nice uh, framework that V. Byrne and uh, Byrne Dixon, Rosowski, something I can't remember, Carol Byrne Rosowski discovered uh, twenty something years ago. Uh, you can do a matrix tree theorem on this, and you can express this for they, they express the MHV amplitude as a sum over trees where the propagators were given by this. Well, but, you know, the edges of the trees were given by this expression here, and um, uh, uh, that was basically it, actually. And um, uh, uh, so, 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 for ten years, or maybe even twenty years, there's been a question as to why, how is it, why is it that we get such a remarkably structured formula that really inherits nothing of the space-time understanding that we have of gravity? It's it's sort of stunning, really, but the. the you know, just look at the number of Feynman diagrams you get uh, from conventional gravity, any conventional perturbation theory, and, and this is just a stunning formula. Uh, and so the answer is going to be later, as a, some sort of uh, a spoiler that, that, that we will see, that, that, that this actually arises as a, what you might call a tree-level correlator of a bunch of vertex operators. And the um, uh, 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 so the sum of the trees is just the Feynman diagrams for this correlator, and then the matrix tree theorem sums them up into this deter reduced determinant. So that's uh, that, that's part of what will happen later in this lecture.
if I don't run out of time, actually. But what is the time constraint? I'm, I'm only up in the end three. Well, yeah, yeah, 10, 10, 10 or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm going rather slowly, but... Um, uh, uh, okay, so that's that, that, that's the introduction, and um, oh, actually, no, this is still introduction, isn't it? So this is a bit more uh, introduction uh, about flat space holography, but in split signature. So, so before I I, I said that I, I gave you that picture of Scry as a light cone with a kind of a future light cone as a cat and a past light cone as a uh, 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 in the past, um, and but in split signature there is no future and past. Uh, spit signature you've got, you could say, two times and two spaces. And, and there is only one light cone. So infinity is actually just one component in split signature. And the other thing that's a big difference is that the, um, uh, uh, the celestial sphere in the red signature, uh, in split signature, it becomes a celestial torus. It becomes S1 cross S1. So, so if you had introduced um, stereographic coordinates on the sphere, lambda and lambda bar, uh, in the red signature, when you analytically continue through to split signature, the lambda and the lambda uh, bar become independent real coordinates, lambda and lambda tilde. And, uh, uh, and you can think of these as really being sort of um, affine coordinates on the projective line. So when I said S1, I'm really sort of secretly thinking of it as an RP1. So, so it goes from zero to infinity, but with plus infinity identified with minus infinity. So uh, oops. So, so I'm going to have this rational parameter uh, on the torus. That's right. I keep on. Um, right. So, so I guess what you imagine is that amplitudes are giving you a perturbation theory towards. Um, uh, uh, a metric, and usually you're expanding in momentum eigenstates. And I guess that the, the key point is that that perturbation theory has wide analytic continuation properties. So, so, so this is going to be, I, I'll, I'll set up the problem globally in spit signature without the physical meanings that you're used to. Uh, but I will still end up with physical amplitudes by analytic continuation because all of those momenta will continue back. So, so, so I mean, I quite understand your nervousness. Uh, 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 the, I should say I have a version of this talk in, in the red signature, but I but, but I just like this geometry, and I hope you'll like it too. So uh, uh, so 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 it's part of being the mathematician here, and and uh, and there's some things that happen really nicely in split signature where you can really see uh, the geometry in a way that in the red signature it becomes uh, everything's thermological and things have gauge freedom and it gets harder to sort of repin really things down here. Everything would be rigid. And, and, and that's what will make it nice. But I guess you're asking how can the topology changes when you make this rotation. Uh, I'm wondering why they would they care to the state to see measures. I assume that it wouldn't be the important thing for for instance. Oh, but you still need to be global. Yeah. Yeah, things have to still extend out to infinity. You're still considering a global problem of, of things going out to infinity. But uh, and the wick rotation is of course severe. I mean, uh, but it was already when people were talking about incentops, that's a very severe you're going along, you know, analytic continuation is uh, you yeah, analytically continuing a long way. So I guess there you have theorems, you'll tell me. <laughs> So what is sigma sigma p? Yeah, sorry. Okay. So 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 the point is that this first two terms of the standard flat space, uh, and then if you have a general curved uh, space, you 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 start getting some corrections. This capital R is the one over the little r that you're sort of more familiar with, and 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 so these are the leading order corrections, and that's where you first see the gravitational data. So sigma and sigma tilde are the free data for um, or the characteristic data at null infinity for the field. And they're known as um, asymptotic shears. And, and um, uh, what's nice at null infinity is you get this cleaning sort of uh, separation between the self-dual sector and the anti-self-dual sector uh, in the shear and the tilde shear. And this is something which is still true in the signature. You have a sigma and a sigma bar then. Uh, uh, so, so, so you don't have the freedom to set one of these equal to zero. 
So the other point here is that we're expanding around the self-dual sector, where we have the full nonlinear construction for the self-dual sector. And so working in a framework where the self-dual sector can be real is helpful. Um, okay, so um, what happens in split signature is that twisters become real. So twisters are defined as totally null anti-self-dual two planes. And um, uh, so, so the metric has to vanish on them, but in the rate signature, you can only have the metric vanishing on a line, uh, whereas in split signature, you can have it vanishing on a two plane. So, so in fact, we have a whole family of real two planes and, uh, or two surfaces uh, in the curve case, uh, in the self-dual case. And, and what we'll see is that twisters will intersect scry in these in, in certain null geodesics. They'll actually be circles because they're two planes in the interior. They come out to scry and they intersect scry in a circle. And they satisfy this differential equation, which if you're familiar with the Newman work is actually Ted Newman's good cut equation, but he was thinking in the rent signature. So this was uh, 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 an equation of holomorphy for Z rather than um, uh, uh, an ordinary differential equation. So what I'm going to show you later then is how it is that the twister construction encodes these shears, the asymptotic data into two uh, functions on twister space in such a way that they encode the LW1 plus infinity action. And as I say, as, as I've mentioned, there's going to be a Carl Sigma model, which um, uh, gives rise to the, um, uh, uh, the self-dual sector and perturbations around it. Okay, so that's the holography story, but I'm now going to sort of... Um, uh, uh, move on to um, a, uh, 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 a discussion of what happens when uh, we take the sigma tilde equal to zero, we're dealing with a purely self-dual metric and um, uh, how twisters can encode that. Um, but I should say a little bit more. So first of all, um, uh, in four dimensions then, it's well known that the two forms split into self-dual and anti-self-dual parts. And under that, the um, uh, VAR tensor uh, splits into um, uh, 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 self-dual and anti-self-dual parts. And um, so we're going to focus on the situation where the Ricci tensor and the anti-self-dual VAR tensor vanishes so that it's um, self-dual. And this gives a flatness of the um, uh, and, and anti-self-dual two forms. They're covariantly, covariantly constant. And uh, uh, so those of you who are familiar with conformal geometry will know that in split signature, 2-2 two, two signature, the conformal group is SO3-3. Three, three, and the standard model is actually, uh, uh, if you want to see how SO3-3 three, three acts, you think of the space-time as being projective light cone in six dimensions. So uh, uh, the projective light cone in six dimensions can be understood by, uh, uh, first of all, um, introducing three coordinates for the plus and three coordinates for the minus. So those are two, three vectors. And then the light cone condition is the, uh, the, the, the mod x squared minus mod y squared equals zero. So, so you can put mod x equals mod y equals one. And suddenly you see that conformally you have uh, the round sphere metric on one sphere minus the round sphere metric on the other sphere. And that just follows from the embedding formalism, with, which I think people are probably familiar with. Uh, uh, but, but you also have this Z2 um, symmetry, which um, plays a role, but this is meant to be the projective light cone, so you, 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 uh, you're not just rescaling X and Y with positive numbers, but also with negative numbers. So instead of getting S2 cross S2, you have S2 cross S2 over Z2. And in the flat case, the, um, if you look at a flat metric, it goes like 1 over X3 minus Y3 with certain choices. The, this, this conformal factor, factor does, uh, sorry, 1 over x3 minus y3 squared. And that tells you that null infinity is actually at the set x3 equals y3. And you can see straight away that you're getting r cross s1 cross s1 inside s2 cross s2 for this scribe. That scribe has two sides, and this antipodal map identifies the two sides, and it also identifies uh, um, antipodally scry to itself. And the... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, but of course, if you're thinking about this as the asymptotic of space time, the, it, this is an antipodal map. So this is one that uh, uh, I guess Andy was talking about a lot. They said two is the antipodal map, take, taking you from identifying something in that direction or something in the opposite direction. 
And, and so if you want to think about it as null infinity, you really want to think of the limits as being different. So you don't want to take the quotient of scry by the Z2, even if you're only interested in the physical space-time on one side. Okay, so that's, that's the picture of the split signature flatten in Cauchy space and, and how the curvature decomposes. So if we have a self-dual space-time, what happens? Well, uh, I said we have these um, totally null two planes. One way to see them in this S2 cross S2 picture is to just let X be a rotation of Y. And, um, uh, uh, and then you can see that this S2 minus that one, the metric will vanish on it. So you can see that you're getting totally null two planes. And um, the vanishing of the vowel anti self dual vowel tensor means that these beta planes survive as beta surfaces in the curved case. And uh, it's, it's sort of uh, elementary calculation to see that these are projectively flat. And, uh, uh, and, and, and if, if you want to sort of perturb the metric on S2 cross S2, uh, the beta surfaces are ne necessarily either two spheres or RP2s. Okay, that surface is uh, synonym for totally null. Is so the beta surface uh, is, 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 is a totally null anti self dual two, two surface. And so we will have these two surfaces uh, living in our self dual space times. And, um, and furthermore, all of the null geodesics then, if we, if we have these as S2s or RP2s, all the null geodesics are circles, which is a remarkable structure, a very special thing to have. And so um, uh, following, um, uh, so Gielman studied this kind of structure back in the 80s, and uh, he sort of defined an indefinite space uh, where G was a, uh, a metric of some indefinite string signature to be strongly solved by all the null geodesics are embedded circles. And um, uh, we will essentially have these two cases uh, um, where, where the circle goes around once or twice in its projective class. Okay, so um, what can you deduce for all of this? So, so what... I was sorry. So Zoll prize that all the large geodesics are embedded circles, S one. So they join up. So this is of course something you don't really expect to happen in general. But uh, as I'm say, as I say, what, what what you can show is that if you have a um, a, 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 a compact split signature self dual space time, that will happen because of the flat, uh, the projective flatness of the. Uh, alpha plane. Uh, sorry, the beta plane. So what's the alpha surface? You just define the surface. Oh, oh, sorry. The alpha surface is when you have the opposite orientation. So it's the SO3 with a negative determinant. No, sorry, it's the O3 with a negative determinant. Um, okay, so. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Actually, we, we didn't need. Uh, one of the things we got rid of in the paper was that the need for that distinction. But the uh, 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 it, the strong is saying that they have the same projective length, and so so so, so when you have a a, a, a conformally invariant circle, it, it, you know, with just in a conformal space, uh, uh, you don't necessarily have an affine parameter, but you do have a projective parameter, and that projective parameter can go around more than once. And and so on S two it goes around twice. Uh, you know the dystopian fields will vanish at two points, whereas on RP two they they just vanish once. Okay, so what do we prove? We pro we prove that the uh, twister construction had a kind of a very clean statement in this global context S two cross S two uh, 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 where, where you had a compact space. So we showed the sum. Um, so we, we we made the condition that the, the force manifold was Zollfrei, so all the null geodesics are circles with self dual curvature. And then uh, um, I mean Claude's a bit of a whiz with the um, uh, you know these topological differential top topological arguments. You can show there's only two cases. So it has to be either S two cross S two or S two cross S two over Z two. Uh, so that is. S2 plus S2 over Z2 is the same topology as the conformal compactification of the 2 2 Minkowski space. And, and this S2 cross S2 is then its double cover. And um, uh, this one was actually sort of rigid. The first case that it is, uh, uh, you only get the standard conformal structure. But in this case, there's, you can get three functions of three variables worth of conformal structures. And um, we could parameterize them rather precisely. So the twister theory. 
ended up be, uh, you could still have a complex projected three space as your uh, complex Twister space. But what happened was that the real slice, which are the real ones I was talking about before, so the real slice RP3 becomes deformed into a, uh, uh, oh, damn, um, in, in, into this um, PTR. Uh, and, and so what you imagine then, sorry, this is a terrible cartoon at the bottom. So that's meant to be CP3. This should really be R3 in the imaginary direction. So you have the standard flat RP3, and then it gets deformed as the graph of some map from uh, uh, RP3 into the sort of normal bundle. So that's meant to be an R3. Um, so you have three functions of three variables. So it's a graph of some map, F from RP3 to R3. And um, uh, the, um, uh, 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 and this is quite rigid. So, so that is to say that the CP3 has a complex structure, is defined up to just the ordinary sort of uh, PGL4C. Um, and um, uh, okay, so you can re uh, parameterize your your, uh, uh, your your deformed PTR, but if you express it as a graph, these functions f uh, are defined uh, essentially uniquely uh, up to PGL four. So okay, so that gives you a uh, characterization of just the conformally self dual case. So there's not very conditionally exclude non complex and non yeah, because I mean, uh, uh, the yeah, because uh, uh, all if it's non compact, not not this, it would go off to and this is they wouldn't be able to join up circles. So, yeah, um, okay, so so so, so this that's <laughs> brilliant, yeah, I think it was a joke, yeah. Uh, there was nobody named like that. That's... Oh, well, sorry, there was Otto Sol. Uh, so this is a problem that goes back yeah, to, 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 to um, so, so if you just do this on two surfaces, then Otto Sol sort of set up this, this, this um, problem of classifying two surfaces, all of whose geodesics were closed. And, um, uh, uh, and there's a very similar theorem there um, uh, uh, in which um, the, the two surfaces have to be if it either RP2 or S2, the projected plane or S2, if it's a projected plane, the flat one, S2, you have a free function of two variables. So, so this is very much parallel to this classic story that goes back to the beginning of the last century. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, so the Zoll prize, a joke there on Otto Zoll's name. Uh, okay, so, so, so I don't want to go into the proof of this. But, 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 but uh, one thing that will play a role is the reconstruction of space-time. And uh, so one of the things I didn't say was that uh, I, I said what twisters look like in space-time with these totally null two planes. What do space-time points look like in twister space? Well, in this construction, uh, uh, we're going to reconstruct space-time as a space of holomorphic disks in CP3 whose boundary lies on this deformed uh, uh, real twister space. So that's what this DX is meant to be a um, cartoon of. And, and so, um, uh, so each point X and N is a holomorphic disk in the complex twister space whose boundary is in this PTR. And uh, uh, that there's a routine for studying these moduli spaces that, that's well um, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's uh, well documented now. Uh, these had to have degree one in uh, the relevant relative cohomology class. And um, uh, you, you, you dis discover that there is a four dimensional moduli space of such homomorphic degree one disks. And, it, and they have a compact moduli space. And this is your self dual four manifold. So, so, so just given that deformation of the real slice, you can reconstruct the 4D space time as a modular space of these homomorphic disks. But you really have twisted lines, but now it's disks. So yeah, so that's the novelty. That's the novelty of these constructions. The, 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 uh, you just have the disk, yeah. That's because of split signature? Or... That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's a consequence of split signature. And uh, so, so in particular, um, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the boundary of all the disks uh, gives you sort of uh, analogs of lines in the real uh, twister space. And uh, you can see it's a co-dimension uh, one condition for two of these things to intersect, just as it is in the flat case. 
and and you discover that uh, so 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 if this capital X and this capital X prime are the intersection uh, are these boundaries of the corresponding polymorphic disks, uh, then their intersection means that the two points X and X prime are connected by a light ray. So so that's a summary of the kind of the twisted construction, and it's also meant to motivate considering polymorphic disks inside this twisted space. So, so that, that was what Jordan and I did sort of um, uh, 15 years or more ago, and what I was lecturing about here in the IHP back in 2003 or something. Um, the, um, uh, uh, but what we didn't do was to worry about how to get Einstein vacuum. Uh, I think Claude taught papers long enough already, thank you, and wanted to get on with putting it out. And at the time, who thought this might be useful? And um, so, 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 so to see how how you actually make it um, uh, uh, richly flat, uh, Einstein vacuum, uh, um, that uh, we can actually follow. Um, we can adapt Roger Penrose's nonlinear graviton from 1976 to split signature in, in this context. So, so what he does is he uh, introduces um, a Poisson structure on twisted space, and um, uh, so, so you divide the coordinates up into a pair of spinners, lambda alpha and mu alpha dot. The Poisson structure is in the mu coordinates, and the lambda alpha you can think of really as being coordinates on a real, uh, well, well, on a projective line, real or complex, and um, uh, uh, the, 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 you can actually project down to that projective line. Anyway, so he introduces these two structures, and in our context, you can characterize the Einstein vacuum case by requiring that these two structures, this Poisson structure and this um, one form, are real on the real slice. And this is, uh, uh, and we can follow through the proof and adapt Roger's proof to this case. And uh, now this is the point at which you might uh, uh, um, uh, see some um, something about LW1 plus infinity. So, uh, I, I can't assume that everyone knows what uh, LW1 plus infinity is. So uh, uh, this story goes back to the 80s again. So, so Zamenhochikov asked the question as to what happens if you have a CFT with a higher spin symmetry? And I guess um, uh, 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 N was meant to characterize the, um, uh, 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 the, the spin uh, the, 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 you, you know, so you have conserved current, I guess, and and you, he, he, uh, what he discovered is you could essentially bootstrap these things, and you could actually write down these CFTs in two dimensions. So it became sort of uh, quite an exciting thing. And then um, uh, 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 I think Jens Hopp, when uh, he was studying uh, M2 brains, um, noticed, well, in that case, you actually had... Um, high spin symmetries of all um, spins, so n goes to infinity, and he, he interpreted that in terms of the plus and diffeomorphisms of the plane of the brains, the M2 brains. And uh, so, so this is just in the classical limits. And in fact, the story I'm talking about today, uh, I, I'm slightly embarrassed to say, really is only about little w1 plus infinity, not big. Because the, the big one is the quantum one that Zamenhochikov was excited by, whereas here we're really just going to be talking about the um, plus and diffeomorphisms of the plane. So for us, the plane is going to be this mu alpha dot plane on which we have this uh, Poisson structure that Penrose gave us back in the 70s. And uh, in this case, in fact, it's a real one, uh, at least in our split signature context, it, 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 this, this is a real one. And um, uh, in order to write down the sort of algebras that people were writing down, you, you can just decompose uh, the, the space of... So, of course, the, the plus and diffeomorphisms are generated by Hamiltonians, and um, uh, you can decompose them into polynomials in your mu coordinates. So, so, so th this, this is the uh, W infinity. Uh, the 1 plus infinity comes if you allow yourself the constant Hamiltonian, just the Hamiltonian 1. So, of course, it's... A trivial vector field, but you know it's it, it's it, it, it's still Hamiltonian. And um, anyway, so so the Poisson brackets then give rise to the commutation relations of W one plus infinity, uh, allowing, as I say, the constants. 
but actually, we've also got an extra variable in our story. So we've got these lambda variables. And these you can think of as being um, uh, living on an RP1 or a circle. And, and so the loop algebra then has the loop coordinate um, lambda 1 over lambda 0 or tan theta over 2. And I guess in the usual presentation, you might encode that uh, by just having some ECIR theta in the loop variable. And this then extends the bottom brackets to this LW1 plus infinity algebra. Um, so this is the algebra that uh, Andy Strominger discovered by analyzing soft limits of gravity amplitudes uh, at null infinity in a Lorentzian scribe. So he just he discovered this algebra uh, uh, just by maybe he had some encyclopedic memory and he had to do a light ray transform. It was really quite non-trivial to, to get there. It wasn't just a kind of, um, you know, people sometimes grumble a bit about, about celestial holography as to what's trivial and what's non-trivial. This is something really non-trivial. And um, uh, 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 that the, the, the you could land on this kind of famous algebra. And what we see here then is, is that this is precisely the, the group of structure preserving diffeomorphisms of this real projective, uh, this, this real twister space. So this is, this is the diffeomorphism. So he discovered that hiding in the soft limits of gravity amplitudes. Oh, this is one extension of this algebra and this is fine. Um, there's a there, there's there, there's a lot of work by Chris Pope and friends, which um, well, I mean, that, but that's the quantum thing, and they have a lone, lone star. Uh, so you mean W being classical, but loop being sort Yeah, I guess the well, well, I guess this is the the one plus is already some central extension, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I yeah, sorry, you're asking whether there are more than one. Uh, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, okay, so um, so this is a slightly abstract framework here that I've said here that the Poisson structure and, and the uh, this one form had to be real, and um, uh, okay. That, anyway, that's actually the first punchline. Here, here we have a presentation. This is self-dual gravity, and we have a presentation now in the twister space where you see the geometric role of this LW one plus infinity. It is just a structure preserving different morphisms of the twister space. The um, but we want to get sort of a bit more concrete. Uh, uh, I said before, one of the things that I was excited by in this LeBrun construction uh, that, that Claude and I had was the rigidity of the presentation of the uh, gravitational data. Of course, if you're working out infinity, you have the shears, you have the sigma, and that that that's all, those are also they're defined up to super translations, but they're they're fairly rigid too. But here, this is a completely different one, and it will also be the one that's uh, uh, so, so can we classify the functions whose graphs give us the um, vacuum Einstein, self-dual vacuum Einstein spaces? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, so we, if you divide your homogeneous coordinates up into real and imaginary parts, u and v, uh, then you can just write down the generating function now. So you have this simple function h that's homogeneity degree two. And then you can say that the imaginary uh, part of the twister on on uh, so the, I'm, I'm deprojectivizing this the, the the real twisters now, and the uh, imaginary part is just just given by h as a generating function dh by du essentially uh, or the Poisson bracket on that. But in this Einstein case, what it means is that the lambda part uh, is actually real. The, the imaginary part of the lambda is this the alpha, and but the, the, the mu part uh, is given by the derivative of this h. And um, uh, uh, and so our construction then gives a one-to-one -one correspondence between such H's, these homogeneity degree two functions, H and uh, uh, self-dual two split signature vacuum metrics on S2 cross S2 with a null infinity modeled by what I was saying yesterday, R cross S1 cross S1. And uh, uh, so, so here, because the Poisson structure is, is the one that's adapted to the LW1 plus infinity, you can think of th this um, really as, as telling you that the self-dual gravity phase space then is, is given by sort of complex Poisson diffeomorphisms, sort of shifting the real slice, the RP3 to this, this what I call PT sub R, 
uh, divided by the diffeomorphisms of that real slice. So it's some homogeneous space for this um, uh, infinite group. Yeah, about 20 minutes, including questions. Okay, so. Um, it's about formal solution, which, uh, which can be different. And you can break it, or does it take into account like regularity of this? But this is a, a smooth. Uh, uh, in, in, at this point, this is a result in differential geometry that says that for each H up to some sort of small equivalence, there exists a unique self dual. Backing equation on S2 cross S2 with these properties that and vice versa. That is smooth. Yeah, yeah. So the H can be an arbitrary smooth function in particular. Uh, and as I say, this is this this would just be a straightforward mathematical theorem with no statements about how series on and so on. Okay, now here it's still a little bit unsatisfactory. If you're sort of thinking about a scattering problem, you think about having a finite space time and that has a, a, a null infinity, and you go out to null infinity, and you want to say, does that case sit inside this? Uh, uh, is there something more there? Is there something less there? Well, what you can do is you can, you can actually reconstruct this framework just from an asymptotically flat space where you go out to scry to this null infinity, and then you can, uh, re you can follow, in some sense, um, Roger's original argument to reconstruct a twisted space at uh, null infinity and to um, uh, reconstruct all of these structures here. And just to sketch this, uh, although maybe I should be fast just so I can get onto the amplitude part of the talk, uh, uh, you can, um, uh, uh, that, that you can, that you, you see the, each alpha plane is intersecting scry in a, this is actually a null geodesic in the lambda equals constant plane and the um, uh, and this is actually going to have to be a circle because it's the boundary of some two plane that cuts across space time, the two surface that cuts across space time. And the um, uh, uh, and in fact, Lord and I had a theorem before the one uh, that that that, that uh, I mentioned earlier that actually referred to this case of having a projected structure on, on a plane and sphere. Um, and this was actually our proof of the famous old Zoll uh, um, story, Zoll radon story, um, uh, in two dimensions. And so you can apply that to get the H on each uh, fiber space mu. And then um, this allows you to reconstruct it in general. And, uh, and what you actually see is that there's a, a, a in linear theory. This is uh, uh, the map between the shear and the H is, is given by a radon transform. And, um, uh, uh, and in linear theory, this sigma has, uh, uh, it's, it's basically one to one in the range that we want. So, um, uh, and the inverse, in, inversion of this gives rise to this kind of light ray transform, light ray transform story that, um, and he had to introduce an Atul Sharma sort of elucidated in this context. So, uh, okay. Um, anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that you could just start with uh, an ordinary asymptotically flat split signature space time, take its data at scry, and you can still do this. Uh, so, 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 that, so, 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 in fact, remarkably, you, you construct this whole S2 cross S2 uh, from that. Maybe in the interest of uh, time, I'll just skip over the examples. You can do examples which are split signature analogs of things like um, the uh, uh, given talking ANSATs, and you can be very explicit because of the integrability, uh, just reducing things to linear integral formally. And you can even write down a self to a Schwarzschild, although its topology would be slightly different. Okay, so uh, um, okay, so now changing gear. So what I want to do now is to uh, uh, Sorry, maybe I could have stopped and asked a question so at this point. Okay. Uh, okay, so in some sense, I've already sort of motivated the study of holomorphic disks uh, uh, whose, whose boundaries are in this real slice, um, but motivated by the twister string. So the twister string, in order to construct scattering amplitudes, uh, one has to um, uh, uh, consider curves of higher degree. So at degree one, you construct the MHV amplitude, 
But at a higher degree, you construct the rest of the um, Yang Mills and uh, supergravity S matrices. And so in this context, we can try and do the same. Um, and so what, what you um, can do in order to incorporate the higher degree is, is to um, represent uh, the twister as a function of sigma. So sigma is meant to be a coordinate on the, um, uh, on the disk, but now I'm really thinking of the disk as the upper half plane. So, so uh, the boundary of the disk is going to be when sigma is real. And uh, we're going to choose um, k points on the boundary. And if you want to write down um, uh, 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 a degree k minus one disks through these k through k points in twister space, uh, um, uh, well, so 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 in flat space, in, in the flat case, uh, this is the formula for um, uh, uh, oops for for, for the um, uh, degree k um, curve that goes through. Uh, k points. So there is a unique disk that goes through a, a, a prescribes k points on the boundary. So this is some counting that you can do to see that. Uh, in the curve case, though, in order to make it sort of lie in this PTR rather than in... Um, so, so this is manifestly real on, on the boundary for the RP3, but if you want it to be in the deformed space, you're going to have to have some correction term. I think I'm sorry, the sphere is PTR. Yes. So the um, well, this is this is in the Agnostic Twister space now. So so I guess what I gave you on this previous slide here was in some sense construction of the Agnostic Twister space. Um, its connection to the celestial sphere is um, uh, uh, you can map these things to the celestial sphere. Uh, so, so, sorry, to scry. So these these would give you. Um, but they they go off into the complex. Uh, so, so, so in the... Anyway, this point sigma i, this, this is by the direction of the local momentum. No, no, sorry. So, so a degree one they do, uh, but at a higher degree they don't. So, so, so the... Um, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's an important point. So, so for MHV, you can identify these sigmas, sigma i's with the um, outgoing momentum, but at a higher degree you can't. There's, there's some rational map. Um, so take the vision away from the That's right, yeah. Uh, so, um, okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so our sigma model is, is really just going to guarantee that, the, um, uh, that this set of sigma is going to be holomorphic uh, and that it has the right boundary conditions. And what you discover is that um, uh, if you... If you uh, Look at the sort of deviation term here. Uh, then the um, uh, that that only has to have a mu term. The lambda is always real on the real slice. So this this term this first term already gives you the the, the real lambda. So that's fine, um, and that's why you have a degree k map at heart. So de degree one, then the lambdas and the sigmas are interchangeable, but at higher degree they're not. But there's a there, there's a map there. And, and then this, this sigma model then gives you um, the solutions to this, give, give rise to the ends which satisfy this boundary random problem. And, um, uh, uh, okay, so this is just the action for the holomorphic disks. At degree one, it gives you the equations that give rise to the disks that reconstruct the space time, but at a higher degree, they're, they're, uh, they'll still be good for constructing amplitudes. So, Amplitudes are functions of the gravitational data. To start off with, I'm going to consider the self dual part as being fully nonlinear, determined by this uh, H that we were talking about before, a homogeneity degree two function on the real twister space. Uh, but for the anti self dual perturbations, it's a feature of the Penrose transform that um, uh, uh, you should be looking at functions homogeneous to degree minus six. So that, that just happens to be what it is. Uh, I, I can't say more than that without giving a lecture course. Um, and there are standard formulae for what these functions should look like then uh, if they're momentum eigenstates. So they actually have delta function support, which is one of the things that makes these solutions very simple, uh, makes this framework very simple. And this exponent incorporates the fact you're really dealing with a momentum eigenstate. Um, and and uh, uh, so, so, so the... Um, 
so, so I'll just give you the formula for the um, amplitude for K anti-self-dual perturbations on a self-dual background. So, so the uh, uh, so we've got K anti-self-dual perturbations. So, so we have um, uh, the product of the wave functions, the H tilde i's uh, uh, in, in this formula. And then you have to integrate out the insertion points, the zi's and the sigma i's on the boundary of the disk. Uh, but you do need an extra agreement, a, a ingredient. We need um, uh, um, a, a matrix which looks very similar to this Hodge matrix I introduced at the beginning. Uh, which is um, uh, uh, made out of the, um, sorry, they, this is sort of, uh, 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 yeah, so the, the, these are the lambda i, it's meant to be the lambda part of the twister uh, um, z i. Um, so, so, so we have to uh, uh, write down this matrix, and we have a debt prime h tilde of this matrix. This is not the same matrix as I had in the second slide. So the MHV amplitude would be K plus two. Yeah, so the MHV amplitude would be K plus two, and this H tilde will become trivial. So this is a different animal from what we had before. What we had before had square brackets over IJs. This is angle brackets over sigma I, sigma J, and sigma J. Um, okay, so I've, I've pulled that out of thin air, and uh, uh, this as far as this lecture is concerned, and there's a lot of history here. There's the original twister spring, there's David Skinner's twister string for n equals h supergravity. The original twister string just in conformal gravity and Yang Mills. Uh, and um, but before that, there was a Cachado Skinner formula, which generalized the kind of twister string formula for Yang Mills amplitudes to gravity. And, and that's what uh, uh, I used to make contact with this. And so I had to make contact with that perturbatively. So I'm going to take this. Um, uh, uh, that, that I was treating the self-dual sector in a completely non-linear way before, but now I'm going to expand it uh, uh, to make to k plus one up to n gravitons, and so we expand it to first order in uh, momentum eigenstates H i, and the idea will be that I can then make contact with an established formula, and um, uh, uh, and that should then give us the uh, a standard formula that we know for the background perturbative amplitude. And, and uh, in order to do the computation, then we've got to take this on shell action that um, I had in this formula here. Um, and I've got to construct this S on shell. Um, uh, there's a function of H and the insertion points um, uh, to um, uh, uh, in these HK plus one up to HN. And, and uh, so, so, so this is a tree-level computation. So we, what we actually need is a tree-level set, set of vertex operators for the perturbation in the H um, that we had in the, um, uh, you know, so, so the H has appeared just as a boundary integral here. And so these vertex operators then are the perturbative analogs of those. And we're looking at tree-level correlators on that. And so the key point of this, was that the, uh, the the key point of this on shell action here um, that we had here is that the the kinetic term now gives rise to this Poisson bracket structure that we had on Twister space that underpinned the um, uh, that, that un, un, underpinned the um, uh, uh, LW one plus infinity structure. So that's what the Poisson bracket structure does, and with the momentum eigenstates we get this square bracket type term that we saw in the Hodge formula in the numerator, although now we're getting sigma i minus sigma j instead of the momentum spinners. We're getting the world peak sigma i minus sigma j. Um, so where does the determinant come from? We've got a sum over tree diagrams here when we do this uh, correlation function of vertex operators. Well, that you can sum up using a matrix tree theorem. So, sorry, you say that we're using the WPD as a whole structure here, and you still have to take the soft limit, which you have in the um, No. So, in what sense is it a W1 position? Uh, it's, it's there as part of the geometry of the twisted horizontals. But before you're not taking soft limits? No soft limits. And this is not the self dual sector, it's the amplitude. This is the full formula for the full amplitude. 
So everything's written in terms of the twisters, the LW1 plus infinity acts on everything in sight in this, in this formula. So, um, so that's a remarkable thing. Yeah, so anyway, so the upshot of this is it's now equivalent to the Cachazzo Skinner formula, which is a well-known proved formula uh, for the pre-level gravity S matrix. And as Andrew just pointed out, what we see here is that LW1 plus infinity is built into every step in the construction of this formula. There's, there's nothing extraneous. So, so, so that's something that I find quite remarkable in this. The, the, this is something discovered in soft limits when the momentum goes to zero and people think, oh, well, you know, there's all sorts of terrible things happen when you look at finite momenta and so on, it says it's gonna go away. But the claim here is that the LW1 plus infinity is just part of the furniture, it's part of the twister furniture. And you can express the entire amplitude in terms of structures and this Carl Sigma model in the twister space. And this is not self dual fraction. No, I mean, this is this is this is K. So this is the symmetry of the. And what is the. It's a symmetry of the full dim. Yeah. Uh, and at this point, it's a perturbative form. You can analytically continue it wherever you want. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, that's a, 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 so, so it plays two roles, you see. It plays a role as a kind of dithymorphism symmetry of the twister space. You must buy by I. I mean, that's why I put it LW1 plus infinity C over LW1 plus infinity. You must buy by I, and then it's a gravity. Uh, then it's actually generating a deformation. Um, it's all from the it's all from the results of taking soft limits and then looking at the data. So you would have said, okay, this is maybe just a symmetry of the self to a sector of gravity. Absolutely. But here you see that it's it acts on every turn. I mean, I, I don't see what I, I mean. I, I may be being stupid, but I don't see what goes wrong. You know, I mean, all of these structures here are the standard. It's built out of the. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the asymptotic twister space without reference to any other structure except for the Poisson structure and, uh, you know, the loop, I mean, the base. Can you talk about that in three minutes? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so this slide, I, I'll just say it briefly in words. Uh, uh, one of the things that, sorry, this is all joint work with uh, Tim Adamo and Asil Sharma. And, um, uh, uh, and, and so this part is, is, is to do with a paper we wrote sort of a year and a half ago. So you ask the question, what's this got to do with the Einstein Hubbard action? Well, to be honest, I don't really know at high k, but at k equals two, you can actually say things rather precisely. And if k equals two, um, so we just have two of these h tildes, that this h tilde goes away. You look at this on shell action and, um, uh, and what you can do is you can, um, re-express this on-shell action in terms of data for the self-dual background. So this is a non-linear expression now. This omega is, um, uh, it, uh, can be, you can compute the fact that this on-shell action gives rise to the Vabansky uh, uh, potential or the Kähler scalar for the self-dual background. And then you can show that the, if you take Vabansky in a different guise, his gravity action, that the, this second perturbation of the action around the self dual background um, uh, uh, is just given by the integral of a Bansky scalar times the two wave functions for the two self dual gravitons. So, so you can really see at MHV that the, this on-shell signal model action embeds inside the Einstein-Hilbert action, but uh, I wouldn't know how to do this at higher degree. Okay, so, so, so to finish then, um, uh, so just to understand, maybe it's so when you have two H1 and H2 now, I mean, does, does it mean that it's in the MHV or you are? This is MHV. Yes. Yeah, so the H field of one, H field of two, are the two minor three particles, and they, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is something that we do sort of, uh, and uh, I think we were thinking more in sort of a, uh, well, probably ambig ambiguously, but uh, this is uh, uh, maybe Lorenzo, complex or Lorenzo when we were writing that paper. Uh, okay, so various uh, uh, conclusions. Um, so we have this rigidity of conformally flat self-dual 
split signature vacuum metrics with, you know, if you do the antipodal map, then your whole space time has to be flat. So that's a conclusion of what I said before. Uh, uh, you know, if you try to make sigma equals sigma, sigma future in opposite directions, um, and if you if you allow scry to be different in uh, opposite directions, then we get a classification of all such self dual space times in terms of this H, this homogeneity to E2 function on RP3, uh, which is kind of a gauge, a twisted version of the gravitational data. So we can do, we can play some of these games for non zero scaling curvature as well. So that's something I'm looking at more with Claude Rebrun again. Um, and and uh, the reconstruction of the space time by these open holomorphic disks in the twister space leads to this Carroll open sigma model, which at a higher degree computes the gravity amplitudes for all MHV degrees. Uh, but it does give an, uh, an explanation for this theory that underlies a tree formalism as V Burn and friends from 1998. Oops. And uh, okay, so the self dual gravity phase space is given by this LW1 plus infinity, uh, as some sort of homogeneous space for LW1 plus infinity uh, complex. And, um, uh, uh, and as far as I can tell, I mean, you know, yeah, it, it gives the action on the full amplitude. And this encodes really, the, the, this story here encodes the light ring transform that. Andy Strominger introduced, Atul Sharma talked about. And then in our paper, doing it in the red signature, we had a Czech Dolbo isomorphism with a, an A missing there. Uh, okay, so I should stop throwing a mass time. Thank you. Many questions already, but it's time for more. Once the world we sold uh, at the wall like uh, let me call it two string which leads oh, to yes. two comma two yeah. signature is this related to you? Uh, I'm not sure because that string's target is the self to your space time. Yes. Um so I, I did read those papers way back and then again more recently. And and I somehow, it, it, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure something connects, but I didn't see I didn't see how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Is there an analog of this LW one plus infinity for cell-borne angles activations? Well, I mean the, uh, uh, the, the there's an analog of this whole story of the young mills, right. and um, uh, uh, but, but but I guess it's it, it's somehow less structured. It's uh, so, 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 so this would be just the you know, maps of RP3 into the uh, gauge group. So, 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 so there are certainly the first half of this talk, uh, I wrote a kind of um, a Yang Mills version of this paper back in 2007. Um, uh, and, and even including the split signature story. So, 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 so I was, I was, I was. Even the scry story. So I tried to set, set it up as a scattering story. I had great hopes I could make contact with twisted strings at that time. So I put a lot of work into uh, uh, filling out the scry story, but it didn't really connect that well to twisted strings. But I, I, it maybe maybe it sort of uh, does a bit. But it does give a proof of the part of the formula, for example, which maybe is known for a lot of reasons. Yeah. So so I guess um, I, I mean so so. so, so I have a history of writing papers on these sorts of to topics. So the MHV amplitude was obtained from these pastoral, not necessarily in the split signature way, but these pastoral considerations uh, back in um, uh, a paper with Dave Skinner in uh, uh, very much along these lines in, in 2008, I think, or nine. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so there, there is a, a complete Yang Mills analog to the story. Why Lee extrapolates this to an instant in gravity? Can I imagine them integrating over this boundary uh, space of uh, of the metric using this parameterization of the boundary space? Um, so I, I guess in the in the Yang Mills case, I, I, I mean, I had a student working on instant on backgrounds quite a long time ago and it kind of got a bit messy. I think we know a bit better how to do some of these things now. 
Uh, but there is a big story, isn't there, about integrating over into some modular spaces. And I, I think um, those, as you were observing, they're all. Well, yeah, I'll send you that on the video. But unless you use supersymmetry and the representation, you mentioned trouble. I don't know about this space. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether there's an amplitude analog of those computations. Those computations tend to be producing super potentials of various forms, don't they? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, so, so I think that's another challenge is to see if there's an absolute version of, of that story or, or maybe adapt it to other observables in, 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 in uh, quantum field theory. Okay. Are there questions online? No questions here? All right, so let's thank you. Yeah, no one has Have a half an hour break before the next talk. It's not going to be here. We've got a few minutes to go for or not. We're going to go to bound for what is the cognition of what the same is. You are in the air terms of the secret of the cognition that I think that.